Thank you, Angelo. Uh, I apologize for that long uh, introductory uh, set of comments. I told Angelo I could have provided him with a shorter, more colorful uh, version, but it probably wouldn't gotten through uh, censorship. Uh, <laughs> For a speaker, there's almost nothing worse than being an after-dinner speaker, and unless it's a before-dinner speaker, uh, because that, of course, is a barrier between you and your food, and I'm sure it'll be quite good. Uh, I, I love that musical, visual celebration of Canada. Uh, that was just marvelous. Uh, and, and I know that the proximity of the Canadian and American flag uh, isn't lost on anyone. Uh, s certainly not me celebrating uh, these two great countries and our wonderful uh, kinship, which appears only to be compromised when the U.S. and Canada square off in a hockey game, uh, <laughs> <laughs> when the U.S. always gets its rear end kicked. <laughs> but even then, I'm, I'm sure that uh, that's done in good sportsmanship, perhaps an hour after the, the Yanks lose, and, uh, and we come back and and enjoy this uh, wonderful uh, kinship that I certainly feel deeply here tonight. It is a great honor to be here. I can't tell you how much. And I want to congratulate you on this marvelous uh, event, this conference that celebrates conservation partnerships, volunteerism, and conservation initiatives. Uh, a wonderful agenda. I participated uh, in most of the programs uh, today. They were challenging, they were relevant, and they were very important. And I want to compliment all of you who, first of all, planned it, and secondly, who presented it, and third, uh, those who listened and asked questions. Uh, it tells me a great deal about all of you, and it's all excellent. My title uh, tonight is Continuing the Triumph of the Commons. And I suspect that requires a little bit of explanation. The, the triumph of the commons is a triumph over what Jarrett Hardin in 1968 called the tragedy of the commons. Uh, quoting Jarrett Hardin, he said, freedom in the commons means tragedy for all. Uh, he was referring to the environmental destruction resulting from farmers grazing a common area without rules and only their self-interest in mind. Of course, that was a metaphor for environmental problems, including the destruction of wildlife in Canada and the U.S. in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The North American model of wildlife conservation, which we celebrate here tonight, defeated the tragedy of wildlife destruction, and we celebrate that model this evening and consider how we can extend that great triumph into the future. That's my theme, and that's why I've chosen that title. I want to recognize three Canadian international treasures in the wildlife profession, who also happen to be Boone and Crockett Club members, and brothers, Valerius Geist, Shane Mahoney, Ian McTaggart Callan, and all the friends from OFA that I've made recently. All have done the most to define, articulate, and advocate the North American model of wildlife conservation. I also want to recognize Canadian friends and Boone and Crockett Club brothers and sisters who helped with these remarks, Winnie Kessler from British Columbia, Evie Merrill from Alberta, Daryl Rolage from Alberta, Vince Crichton from Manitoba, and of course, Val and Shane and Daryl and Angelo and the rest who've been so helpful. Uh, the model is perhaps best explained along with Canada's risks and opportunities in wildlife conservation policy dated 1995, a foundation for my remarks today. I have a copy of it here. It was co-edited by uh, Val Geist and Dr. Ian McTaggart Cowan. It, uh, uh, Val tells me he still has a few left. Uh, the run didn't go that well, mostly because 
Val himself and many of the authors took on servid farming very aggressively. And that interest uh, wasn't pleased, and uh, Val felt that in terms of the distribution. But he still has a few, and uh, you could get them, and I recommend them to you. My objectives tonight are first to discuss our U.S. and Canada uh, common wildlife conservation uh, legacy, to highlight the recent landscape for wildlife and related events, and issues in the U.S. from the club's perspective, to reflect on the 2012 Canadian National Fish and Wildlife Conservation Congress, and to share some personal perspective on four current Canadian wildlife issues that I think are important, at least, chronic wasting disease, mountain pine beetles, and forest wildlife habitat, native and non-native wildlife cooperation, and hunter-angler access. I'll have some closing thoughts. Let me first comment on uh, our common wildlife legacy. I'll share a quote from the 2012 Wildlife Society and Boone and Crockett Club technical review of the North American model that explains the origin of our shared wildlife conservation legacy to quote, it appears that at the turn of the century when both nations, the US and Canada, had become cognizant of wildlife's plight and grappled with solutions, like-minded elites arose on both sides of the border who knew each other and befriended each other and learned from each other's successes and failures and acted on them with insight, brotherhood, and resolve. I think you could name two general periods in our common conservation history. The early period, that I'll call the Roosevelt Laurier era, laid the foundation for the model. Uh, some events, I think, are notable in that period. In 1908, uh, President Roosevelt uh, hosted, called and hosted with Gifford Pinchot's help, uh, the White House Conference of Governors, actually uh, President Roosevelt called all the governors in, most of them showed up, and in that course lectured them on conservation as a new concept, and then asked to consider measures for the conservation of the country's natural resources and to begin an assessment of resources which had never been done before. That was followed in 1909 by uh, uh, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Laurier's uh, invitation of their Mexican counterpart to join in the 1909 North American Conservation Congress, attended by Canada, Mexico, and the United States to discuss international conservation issues. Here in Canada, in nine, from 1909 to 1921, was held the Commission, the Canadian Commission, on Conservation. Uh, Premier uh, Laurier established that commission it was established to combat resource exploitation, that is, exploitation. It sought to provide scientific guidance on conservation of natural resources. During that period, over 200 books and reports were published documenting Canadian resources and related problems. It would be uh, interesting to find some of those old documents and look through them and then compare them to things today. Two of North America's most enduring conservation legacies occurred during that period. In the US, the 1900 Lacey Act, prepared by Congressman John Lacey, a Boone and Crockett Club member from Iowa, which ended interstate trafficking in wildlife. And in 1916, the Migratory Bird Treaty Convention, written almost exclusively by your Charles Gordon Hewitt, who was also a Boone and Crockett Club member. I'd like to say more about Hewitt. He was a brilliant, brilliant person with an amazing uh, resume and a series of accomplishments who died before he was age 40. The thing that binds the US and Canada, I think more than anything else, is the public trust doctrine. It's a binding shared principle. The keystone of wildlife conservation in both Canada and the US, that principle that wildlife is publicly owned and held in trust for the public by the doctrine, that is, by the government. In Canada, Section 109 of the Constitution Act of 1867 states that wildlife is part of land and is within the property belonging to and within the jurisdiction of the provinces. 
Wildlife, however, is not specifically recognized. In the U.S., the 1842 Supreme Court ruling Martin v. Waddell holds that certain resources, or in this case oysters, uh, were a surrogate for wildlife, could not be privately owned. And in 1896, the Supreme Court ruled uh, in Greer v. Connecticut that states own the wildlife within their borders and can strictly regulate their management and harvest. The modern area, that is the modern era, saw the full emergence of the model. Uh, building on the public trust doctrine, it holds that game markets are eliminated, wildlife is allocated by law, wildlife can only be killed for legitimate purposes, wildlife is an international resource, wildlife policy is based on science, and hunting is democratic, that it means everyone has access to it, who qualifies with a license. As a set of principles collectively applied, the model has led to the recovery and maintenance of not only traditional game species in their habitats, but most other wildlife and habitats as well. Val Geist has said that the application of policies extending the model have made American, North American wildlife conservation a great conservation success that defeated, as I already said, Hardin's tragedy of the commons that a century ago devastated North American wildlife. With characteristic enthusiasm, which I deeply appreciate and agree with, Val says, and I agree, that wildlife conservation has become one of the great cultural achievements of North America and the greatest environmental success story of the 20th century. Let me turn to a few recent U.S. wildlife events and issues. We at Moon and Crockett see today's main challenge in wildlife conservation as preserving environmental and wildlife quality in a global system that will likely be increasingly oversubscribed nationally and internationally. Therefore, conservation must occur in the context of global economic growth structured to keep environmental transformation within safe limits. Since the slack will be out of the system, we'll be dealing on the margins of human and resource tolerances. Some response opportunities are that Engaging in good science is important to describe safe environmental limits. And using national and international partnerships and outreach to make the case for sustainable growth, sharing, and wise resource use. A couple of wonderful examples for the U.S. and Canada, of course, would be the 2012 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that, that I know you know about, and then the 1986 North American Waterfowl Management Plan. A partnership we in the U.S. are most proud of is the American Wildlife Conservation Partners, uh, founded at our Boone and Crockett, Mu th that is uh, Missoula headquarters uh, in 2000, uh, where more than 50 uh, NGO conservation organizations came and pledged their commitment to unify our basic uh, interest in, in bringing coherence to policy across the country. And over the past 13 years, the AWCP, with nearly a th representing nearly 6 million hunter conservationists, have leveraged the strength of those hunters and conservationists to advance the interest of wildlife, habitat, and hunting heritage. Uh, AWCP welcomed Greg Ferrant uh, to its summer meeting in Missoula a couple of years ago. For each new administration, the AWCP has offered wildlife for the 21st century uh, recommendations to the president, listing uh, priority uh, policy priorities for wildlife, hunters, and hunting, and we've completed four volumes. And during this period, hundreds of sign-on letters have been sent to Congress and the administration representing interest of AWCP, participating partners in the hunting community on key policy issues. Perhaps most important have been the trusting relationships we've established with, with uh, uh, public officials and administrative, uh, that is, administration representatives. Some results have been what we call the Sporting Conservation Council, appointed to advise the Secretaries of Agriculture and Interior on important matters, an executive order uh, that titled Facilitation of Hunting Heritage and Wildlife Conservation that basically directs federal agencies to advance the interest of wildlife hunters and hunting. A 2008 White House a policy conference on North American wildlife policy and a following 10-year uh, action plan for implementing uh, 
those uh, conference outcomes. Uh, in preparation for that, uh, the Sporting Conservation Council uh, completed a document that identified uh, 10, what we call 10, year, 10 problems of our times. And they became the basis for the conference, the White House conference, uh, which uh, focused those major issues. For example, uh, three of those uh, addressed examples, uh, preserving and strengthening the North American model, climate change and wildlife effects, and access to public and private lands, education for hunters, recruitment, and retention. And uh, I bring that document here today to share with Angelo and, and with Greg uh, uh, with the thought that perhaps uh, uh, Canada's new hunting and angling advisory uh, panel may want to consider uh, those eight and, and the, the homework we did, and, and perhaps it would be useful. And I have that document here, which I'll leave with Greg and Angelo. Boone and Crockett sees many uh, current issues of great importance to wildlife and hunting that demand greater and more effective attention, but there are three of, of overriding and compelling importance that I'll share with you briefly. Uh, number one is ecologically outdated federal environmental policy and law. Number two, climate change and habitat health. And number three, energy wildlife coordination. First, ecologically outdated federal environmental law and policy. The take home message is this. The club will champion the development of frameworks for adaptive environmental policy and law that recognize ecological change as a process and ecological integrity and resilience as goals. This would update the ecological context of current outdated policy and laws, including our Federal Endangered Species Act, our Clean Water Act, and among other problems, that among other problems permit static management in changing ecosystems. Now, let me say a bit more about that. America's Environmental law basically came from Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, that identified uh, DDT as a major source of destruction and death for uh, top of the, of the food chain uh, birds. A whole spate of legislation followed that, and most of them said, stop doing harmful things. And they were written in that time that said, Man's actions are harmful to the environment. Basically, stop them. We still have that spate of laws in the book. What they did not recognize was that ecosystems change. And so many of them resulted in the establishment of conservation reserves, hands-off places in ecosystems that are changing. And of course, the consequences don't make sense when you say you can't do anything to intervene in an ecosystem that requires some interaction because they're changing so rapidly. An example where I live in Oregon, a powerful irony. Federal protection through the Endangered Species Act, primarily for one listed species in the Pacific Northwest, the northern spotted owl, using unmanaged conservation reserves for its protection creates a situation that's harmful for early succession dependent species such as elk and deer. And it's undermining the very hunting heritage and the model based activity uh, that saved wildlife in North America. Uh, just let me tell you as a consequence, there were fewer deer licenses sold in Oregon in 2012 than had been ever recorded since numbers were uh, collected in 1952. The number of elk tags sold in the same year were the lowest since 1972, and that isn't because hunters wanted to quit, it was because the habitat was not there, and the hunting opportunity wasn't such that people wanted to go hunting. So we're uh, going to establish a Center for Adaptive Environmental Law and Policy and develop alternative policy and language frameworks that may or may not find itself uh, into refinements of those laws, but it won't because we didn't try. The take home message for climate change and habitat health. Elk and deer populations habitat are declining in the west, mostly because of deteriorating forest and rangeland habitats, a condition exacerbated by climate change. 
forest and rangeland habitat restoration sh should be among our highest priorities. Unlike uh, a lot of people have been led to believe, our elk and deer populations are declining in the U.S., not increasing. And that means throughout the West, in most habitats, elk populations are going down as are mule deer habitats going down. And it's basically because of habitat deterioration, much of it relating in our dry ecosystems to a condition exacerbated by climate change. Intervention and restoration is mandatory. Key tools would be improved woody biomass markets, permanent and expanded stewardship, contracting and good neighbor policy, comparative risk assessments, and more research. For energy wildlife coordination, the take home message is this. Wild, that is, federal land management agencies should cooperate with state fish and wildlife agencies through formal agreements to meet state wildlife population goals and objectives on federal lands, especially related to energy projects. And what I'm saying is that there's no way in the U.S. where we deal with things like uh, uh, shale production in Colorado or coal production in Wyoming where you can, or oil and gas development in Wyoming where you can simply go figure out how to mitigate every project or here on shale oil projects in Alberta. You can't do that. Our judgment is that simply require the agencies and the proponents to agree on a set of population goals and objectives and then let them figure out how to modify projects to meet them. I want to comment on Canada's National Fish and Wildlife Congress. Congratulations. It's a key to strengthening the model. And it was a great privilege to be invited to work with Angelo and Greg and Shang and the others to help plan and implement that Congress. The partnership harkens back to that at the turn of the century that began our joint conservation cooperation. Prime Minister Harper's announcement at the Congress of a hunting and angling advisory panel was a great standalone uh, success. The Congress's 13 recommendations under the headings of leadership, communications, education, funding, and science provide clear focus and a path forward for advancing fish and wildlife in Canada. Let it be clear that as you strengthen conservation in Canada, you strengthen it in all of North America. At the conclusion of the first of its kind event, the Congress recognized that the model remains at risk and only effective national and international cooperation and conservation partnerships can combat those risks. Together with plans for a second Congress, the Boone and Crockett Club and I welcome our friendship and opportunity to help. A quickly a view of four Canadian wildlife issues. Uh, as a background, however, I want to say that a principal challenge to wildlife conservation in the U.S. in the model and in Canada, U.S., is declining hunter numbers. In the U.S., hunting license holders have declined 14 percent in the last 30 years. Significant recent declines in resident hunting license holders have been reported for British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manito Manitoba. In Manitoba, waterfowl hunters have gone from 60,000 to 12,000, moose hunters from 11.5 thousand to 3.5 thousand, rifle deer hunters from 40,000 to 25 thousand. Migratory game bird hunting permit sales in Canada have declined by two-thirds since 1978. This is a global issue. 11 of 20 European countries showed declines between 1995 and 2005, the largest being in France and Italy. Very recent increases, however, in hunter numbers in some states and provinces are welcome news. Hunter education and recruiting efforts may be working, and I certainly hope so, especially here in Ontario where Greg tells me the hunter education and hunter education enrollment has increased 12 straight years to over 25,000, and in the past two years, small increases have occurred in sales of migratory bird licenses. And I love seeing those kids <laughs> over here last night and to see them pile out to go on projects today. That was marvelous. God bless you for doing that. Hunters and hunting are the foundation for the model. Hunters provide the main political, social, and financial support for the model. 50% of state wildlife agency funds come from hunter licenses and permit fees 
and 70 percent of the funds for fish and wildlife programs in Ontario, as you well know, are provided by anglers and hunters through the special purpose accounts. Long-term declines in hunter numbers place the sustainability of the model in doubt. Without hunters, the model fails. Loss of hunting opportunity, lack of game or access to it is a principal reason for declining hunter numbers, certainly not the only one, but one we can do something about. The decline in forest access roads in Ontario and associated loss of hunting angling opportunities is well known to you by your March 2013 analysis. So in that context, the following four issues I think could have major impacts on hunting opportunity in Canada. I'll discuss each very briefly and some thoughts about opportunities for resolution that could strengthen the positive effect on hunter participation and strengthen the model. First, chronic wasting disease. For me, Daryl Rolage from Alberta was one of the stars of the 2012 Congress. No one has done more to shed light on that problem. Chronic wasting disease, as you know, is a disease of the nervous system involving infectious proteins or prions in deer, elk, and moose. And how do we lose hunters? 70,000 fewer hunting licenses were sold in Wisconsin after chronic wasting disease was discovered in 2002. Most hunters have not returned. The presence of disease results in dramatic de decline in hunters. Jack Thomas and I left Ottawa shaken and worried, an irony since the disease likely had its origin in Colorado in 1965 and is more widespread in the U.S. than in Canada. Darrell tells me this new disease, 50 to 60 years old now, occurs in 22 states, two provinces, Saskatchewan and Alberta, and in South Korea. Wildlife domestication or privatization Servid farming, if you will, is a disease factor influenced in Alberta by the Livestock Industry Diversification Act. Where it emerges, chronic wasting disease is growing in its prevalence and spreading geographically. Collaborative efforts with all stakeholders, including governments, is urgently needed to address the problem. Infected areas should be targeted with selected hunting. Alberta's cull has mitigated the spread to some degree. If it spreads more widely to moose and possibly caribou, effects could be catastrophic. Montana and Wyoming, key big game states in the U.S., ban elk deer farms for canned shoots. Eighteen other states ban canned shoots. The Boone and Crockett Club opposes canned shoots for big game and supports state bans on imports, exports, and captive deer and elk. Darrell and the Boone and Crockett Club leaders met uh, just a couple of days ago in Denver uh, and our Wildlife Health Committee is working hard to figure out how to add value to what Daryl's already doing with, with publication through a film. Angelo has written a very excellent piece that was uh, on, on the threats of chronic wasting disease and servid farming in your Ontario out of doors. I know you know that. OFA needs to be congratulated and encouraged to continue the elimination uh, it, its position to eliminate and phase out game farms. Congratulations. That's a courageous position, perhaps one of the best things you can do to remain chronic wasting disease free, and I know that that's going to be an upheld push with the servid farming industry and, and uh, the parliament that, and the legislators that uh, uh, have to respond. Mountain pine beetle. In the past 10 years or so, the mountain pine beetle epidemic has spread to about 45 million acres of lodgepole pine in British Columbia, killing much of it. Since 2006, beetle infestations have advanced to the edge of the boreal forest in Alberta and in the Yukon and the Northwest Territory as climate warming lifts temperature limitations that once held beetles in check. Maybe that changed this year. It was cold, wasn't it? Jack pine, or boreal forest in northern Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario, and across Canada, are at risk. Although maybe decades away, they remain at risk. Which OFA and Ontario recognized in 2011. Ontario has 124 million acres of boreal forest, an area of roughly the size of France. It's home, as you well know, to 300 species of migratory birds, Threatened, that is, threatened woodland caribou. 
but large populations of moose, fur bears, wolf bears, upland game birds, and other wildlife. All resources are potentially at risk. If the mortality effects of beetles on very large, as greater than 100,000 acres, landscapes of lodgepole pine in British Columbia is a likely precedent, then large landscapes in Ontario boreal forest, caribou and moose habitat could be reduced or simplified by beetle kill, losing the habitat variety that is valued by all undulates. Worse yet could be the lost productivity of soil that could be sterilized or rendered hydrophobic by large, intense, uncharacteristic wildfire. Its potential loss of habitat diversity, including clever and site productivity, would not benefit caribou, moose, birds, fur bearers, or many other species. We're seeing major ecosystem changes, transformations in the US from large megafires like these that could occur and are currently occurring in fire-prone forests that may be permanently eliminating Ponderosa pine habitats in Arizona and New Mexico. Such large potentially habitat transforming effects when combined with unrestrained aboriginal hunting and increased access would not be good for moose, hunters, and hunting and sustaining the model. Winnie Kessler, Boone and Crockett Club member and immediate past president of the Wildlife Society lives in Prince George, British Columbia, long known as moose country and ground zero for the pine beetle epidemic. She says that forest landscapes around here look nothing like they did 20 years ago, and that moose hunting is way down, and marten have grown scarce. Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario have joined in a partnership to help prevent the spread of mountain pine beetle into northern boreal forests. OFA, through Ed Reed and Matt DeVille, that is uh, Matt DeMille, in 2011, wrote a wonderful piece, and they weighed in on the threat very thoughtful. Partnerships to contribute mitigation and reclamation restoration planning that favors caribou, moose, birds, fur bearers, and their needs are critical responses to this threat. Perhaps your toughest topic, and I hesitate to weigh in very heavily, native and non-native wildlife cooperation. I'm aware that Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982 guarantees natives, that is, First Nations, Indians, Aborigines, and now Métis, in Ontario and elsewhere, the right to hunt, fish, trap for food year-round on all unoccupied crown lands and other areas with rights of access. Hunting, fishing, and trapping rights are individual rights, as you well know, not group rights. So native leaders can only encourage cooperation by individuals, not require it. I'm also aware that provinces have limited power to manage wildlife. Manitoba's Vince Crichton is quoted as having said, there's licensed hunters, treaty Indians, and Métis. How can you manage a resource such as moose when you can only control one of those groups, licensed hunters? Well, it reminds you of Hardin's invocation, doesn't it? Freedom in the commons to do what you want means tragedy for all. A compelling problem. Across the boreal forest fringe, including parts of Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia, moose populations are down from 20 to 70 percent, and moose licenses in some provinces are half of what they were a generation ago. Regardless, native hunting rights cannot be regulated or controlled. Areas may be closed to licensed hunting of moose lacking populations in excess of the entitlements of the native people. Provinces are limited in seeking cooperation from natives to voluntarily limit the exercise of their rights. Ontario challenges uh, such as the fisheries uh, double standard was well pointed out by Bill Blackwell uh, regarding uh, the uh, MNR uh, agreement with SON to commercially fish Lake Huron. So I don't have to tell you about this problem. I would just suggest there's a couple of models in the U.S. that might apply. Uh, one I refer to as the 1974 Bolt decision. In that case, uh, Judge Bolt was a federal judge in, in, the, in, uh, in uh, the court in Seattle. Uh, a suit was brought by 22 tribes in the state of Washington about allocating opportunity to fish in the state of Washington and the Columbia River. Out of the Judge Bolt decisions uh, came 
co-management, which means that all parties, including uh, uh, First uh, Nations, agencies, and private citizens, have now, since 1976, sat down at the table and agree, as co-managers, what should happen, how to allocate the outcome, and how to manage. And in Alaska, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act uh, uh, established 10 regional subsistence councils, federal subsistence board where natives are engaged and charged with the responsibility to manage, not just take. Well, those concepts may eventually work. I, I hope they do. It's a compelling problem that you know better than I must be solved. The current situation, while maybe politically correct, is unsustainable and perhaps represents one of the greatest threats to the model. As I think about a possible solution, uh, it, it's clear that, that maybe bureau, bureaucratic charges or court decisions aren't applicable. Maybe it's native and non-native land ethic that can bring, bring people together, perhaps higher order motives for all to come together to join stewardship of Canada's wildlife and commitment to strengthening and improving the model. I think in the end, perhaps native cooperation in management based, based on their cultural values extending back thousands of years, revering wildlife, when wildlife becomes risk because of the current situation could be a compelling reason for cooperation. Finally, hunter access. Few things contribute to loss of hunting, fishing opportunity like limited sportsman access. Conversely, few things have the potential to increase hunter-angler participation and strengthen the model than increased access. As noted above in that document, uh, uh, the decline in Ontario in sportsman access and associated loss in hunting, angling opportunities is well known uh, from your, and I think that's Sherry Soke's March 196, uh, that is March 1913, doggone it, 2013 analysis that documented a loss of over 7,600 miles of sportsman's access between 1996 and 2009. A similar problem exists in the U.S. and is addressed in this document uh, that I'm sharing with Greg and Angelo in a chapter entitled Perpetuating Hunter Traditions Access to Public and Private Lands. Opportunities outlined in that chapter have been helpful in the U.S., and I hope they can be helpful to you. Finally, so we can get to dinner, my closing thoughts. No one thing could be more powerful in strengthening the model than enshrining the public trust doctrine in legislation. It's a great idea. Saskatchewan's doing it. Ontario should do it. Every province and every state should do it. Wildlife is not specifically recognized in Section 109 of the 1867 Constitution Act. Quoting from the Wildlife Society and Boone and Crockett Club document on the model, quote, bringing wildlife into the public trust doctrine through statutory measures appears to be the best way to accommodate the goal of extending the public trust doctrine. To this end, statutory language that clearly puts wildlife in public ownership is necessary. I brought with me a model of statutory language that's in a, in a Wildlife Society technical review, the public trust doctrine, which I'll leave with you as well. Finally, I'll end where I began. With that quote, it appears that at the turn of the century, when both nations had become cognizant of wildlife's plight and grappled for solutions, like-minded elites arose on both sides of the border that knew and befriended each other, learned from each other's success and failures, and acted on them with insight and resolve. Accordingly, like our forefathers in 1909, and as recommended in the Wildlife Society and Boone and Crockett Club document, I recommend that OFA, the Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation, the Canadian Wildlife Federation, and the Boone and Crockett Club join in a partnership with others to convene a North American Conservation Congress, including key administrators and stakeholders in wildlife conservation and management in the US, Canada, and Mexico, to revisit the key challenges facing wildlife conservation in North America, assess the model's principles and their application and adequacy, and develop joint strategies for consistent continental delivery. 
consistent with the great conservation leadership legacy we've all inherited, I think we should do no less. By having the courage to face difficult circumstances, our forefathers formed a common front to protect a common resource for what turned out to be our common future. They showed us the way, and in Darrell's words, to a triumph of the commons. Let's continue together with more passion than ever before to follow that road, and thank you so much.